solution. Jimmy and Paulie started whacking everybody. He justified it by, uh, you know, uh, insulating himself and, and, you know, and Paulie and our family from, uh, you know, from everybody else involved. Over the next year, the bodies piled up and Henry started getting nervous. For years, he had thought of Jimmy as an older brother. Now, he wasn't so sure. He's the kind of guy that can look in the eye, give you a hug, and, and put an ice pick in the back of your head while he was doing it. Hill was wary of Burke, but still conducted business with him. They were now selling cocaine and heroin together, and Henry was becoming addicted to both. Between his dealing and drug abuse, Hill's life was spinning out of control. He was so into it. I mean, you remember the scene from Scarface? The Al Pacino's going like this with all of the, the coke? That was Henry. At that stage in his life, he couldn't get enough of it. Henry was becoming paranoid. He was certain the police were watching his every move. One evening in early May 1980, Henry was at his home in Rockville Center, Long Island. He was on the phone arranging a drug shipment to Pittsburgh and cooking dinner for his family and his drug courier. He and the courier were leaving for the airport when the courier realized she forgot her hat and refused to travel without it. When Henry took her home to retrieve the hat, police surrounded his car and arrested him. They had the wiretaps, they had surveillance, that is, detectives who were watching and following. Uh, they had the airline tickets, and Henry was in a very tight box. Henry was now in jail, charged with narcotics trafficking. His violation of the mob rule against drug dealing was no longer a secret. On top of that, 13 men associated with the Lufthansa heist had been killed. Henry feared he was next on Jimmy Burke's hit list. After all, Henry could not only link Jimmy to the heist, but to drug dealing as well. There's no question that Burke wanted him dead because Burke wanted him silenced. And he wanted him silenced because Burke knew that Henry was a loose cannon. Mob capo Paul Vario was the only one who could protect Henry from Jimmy. But Henry's arrest was a big disappointment to Vario. Hill would have to plot his next move very carefully. You look in my eyes, you lied to me. You treated me like a f***ing jerk. Like I was never nothing to you. Paulie, after what you said, I couldn't come to you. You know, I, I, was, I was ashamed. No, I'm, I'm ashamed now. But I got nowhere else to go, Paulie. You're all I've got, and I really, really need your help. I really do. Take this. <laughs> now I gotta turn my back. Whenever Henry Hill found himself in trouble with the law, his friends in the New York mob had always been there to help him out. But not this time. In May 1980, Hill was in a Long Island jail, charged with drug trafficking. His wife Karen was also charged as an accessory. Karen had been caught helping Henry arrange his drug deals. The 36-year-old Hill knew that if he went on trial, wiretaps would show that his mob cohort, Jimmy Burke, was involved in cocaine and heroin trafficking. Henry feared that it was only a matter of time before he and his family were dead. After all, he had broken the mob's strict rule against drug dealing, a rule that his mafia leader and surrogate father, Paul Vario, had warned him never to violate. Henry was convinced that Vario would not protect him from the wrath of Jimmy Burke. I don't know whether it was paranoia or whether it was for real, but they, Henry certainly believed that Burke was prepared to kill Karen, his kids, and himself. I think what put him in line for a hit was that he knew about a lot of things that the Burke crew and the Vario crew were engaging in. He was just too great a risk at that point. Henry posted bail of $100,000 on Friday, May 16th. 
Two days later, he met Burke at a Long Island diner. Jimmy assured Henry that he wanted to help him beat the rap and get back on his feet. In the meantime, you know, my wheels were, you know, started working, and I mean, I knew I was a dead man. By this point, federal prosecutors, afraid that Hill would disappear after he posted bail, had secured another warrant for his arrest. They told the judge they needed Henry as a material witness, meaning someone who knew about criminal activity. Henry was going to have to talk, or he and his wife, Karen, were going to prison. He readily acknowledged that um, his life really wasn't worth much, that he expected that he would be executed by uh, the people with whom he worked in the Lucchese family, and he realized that he had no choice but to, uh, but to cooperate with us. On May 23rd, 1980, Henry Hill agreed to testify against the mob and enter the witness protection program. He was so nervous he could barely speak. I remember he was... Um, he wanted to call his wife to tell his wife where he was and I let him use the phone in my office and he probably dialed his home number five times he couldn't get the number straight he was just so shook up about what was going on she was I'm not going anywhere I'm not going in the program I'm not leaving my parents you go meaning Henry and I'm staying here with the kids I don't care I'm not afraid of Burke but Karen herself was facing a lengthy prison sentence and quickly changed her mind Henry, Karen, and their two children entered witness protection over Memorial Day weekend, 1980. Hill and his wife were given immunity in exchange for Henry's testimony against the Lucchese crime family, including the men Henry had come to regard as his own family, Paul Vario and Jimmy Burke. Henry was one of the few people alive who could expose details of the still unsolved Lufthansa heist. His decision made him a marked man. When Henry flipped, I mean, he became public enemy number one to anybody who was involved in any organized crime or criminal activity that I ever ran into. And Henry was as hated a person as you could think of. I remember thinking it was predictable that he would turn state's evidence because he was a rat as a kid. If you cornered Henry, he'd sell you, he'd sell a soul. He didn't care as long as he got out of it. Henry and his family were relocated to a modest house in Omaha, Nebraska. Hill often flew to New York to provide information and testify in court. With Henry's help, the government was able to convict Paul Vario for fraud and extortion and Jimmy Burke for murder. It was somewhat difficult for Henry to testify against uh, Vario and, and Burke. Um, he had a long-term relationship with them. He knew them from when he was a little boy, and he viewed Vario as sort of a father figure and Burke as sort of an older brother figure. Hill helped put as many as 30 wise guys in prison, but he was never